All right, well, let's get started. Hopefully we get through everything before the camera dies. Uh, we'll be covering two sections today, two sections next week, and then we only have, well, I think counting this class, we have four more classes worth of material is the easiest way to say it. So, coming to a close, then we'll start a Western philosophy. Huh? Oh, bye. <laughs> Just the next thing comes for the summer. Yeah, okay. Anyways. <laughs> uh, continuing. So, what did we talk about last week? Last week we talked about more kind of topological spaces. Subspaces? I mean, we talked about subspaces almost all year, so. No, that's what we did. Oh, is that what discrete. we did? Discrete. We did discrete. Oh, some aspect of that. Yeah. Okay. No, not that. It's a property of topological spaces. We haven't talked about very many properties. It was, I think, the second one we've introduced. Yeah. We've talked about a topological space being house door. And last week we talked about topological space being connected. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Connected. What did it mean for a topological space to be connected? Don't worry about being too precise, just give me a high level notion of it. Oh, it was that you could, if, if it wasn't so that you could create two groups, if you could separate it into two groups, then it wasn't connected. Almost, um, yeah. You got the right idea. Yeah. A set is, a topological space is disconnected if I can separate it into two non empty open sets. Yeah. Not groups. Open sets. I'm thinking of it as, yeah. Oh, I see why you said that. <laughs> I thought you were thinking back to actual groups. No. So if we can take a topological space and we can separate it into two open sets with no overlap, those open sets can't have any overlap, basically partition it into two open sets, then it's disconnected. And what did it mean to be connected? It meant it's not disconnected. Mm -hmm. And something important that we proved last time is that continuous functions preserve connectedness. So if I have a function from a topological space to another topological space, and I know that the function's connected, and I know, sorry, if I have, so if I have, let's just, two topological spaces, x and y, and I have a function f from x to y, and I know that f is a continuous function, then if x is connected, f of x is connected. Yeah. So continuous functions preserve connectedness, and if a continuous function preserves connectedness, for sure a homeomorphism does. Remember what a homeomorphism is? Yeah, isn't it where like two neighborhoods are close to off from each other? No, homeomorphism was a type of function. Oh, yeah. One to one, onto continuous, and its inverse is continuous. Yeah. Remember that we just did uh, isomorphisms, isomorphisms with yeah. groups? Yeah. Homeomorphisms are the topologies, while isomorphisms are the groups. The way that isomorphism preserves that group structure, homeomorphisms preserve the topological structure. Connectedness is a topological property, so that's one of the things that has to be preserved by a homeomorphism. The other one we already showed is that house door is a topological property, so it also has to be preserved by homeomorphisms. So if your domain space is house door, your image space is house door, if there's a homeomorphism between them. If your domain space is connected, your image space is connected, if there's a homeomorphism. But it turns out you just need a connected function. You don't even need a homeomorphism. That's so if you were more structure than you need. If you were to show that two sets didn't have a topological structure, then it definitely wouldn't be homeomorphic. If it didn't have a topological... Oh, oh right. if you can find two topologies, and you can show that this topology has a property that this topology doesn't have, then you know that no homeomorphism exists between them. So that's the way that you typically demonstrate that no homeomorphism be, exists between two topological spaces, or two topological spaces aren't homeomorphic. You find some topological property that one has and the other doesn't. Correct. Okay. So that's what we were talking about last week. Uh, we're going to be continuing uh, with that this week, talking about connected sets again, and using connected sets to prove uh, very 
useful common theorem in calculus called the intermediate value theorem. So let's jump in. Our first theorem of the day. So we're going to look at R with the standard topology. Remember standard topology on R? Yeah. Just open. The basis elements are open intervals A, B. Mm -hmm. So open sets are any union of open intervals like that. Yeah. Okay. So what are we proving? We're proving R with the standard topology is connective. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do we always prove that something's connected? We assume by way of contradiction that R is not connected, or in other words, is disconnected. Right. And we show that leads to a contradiction, therefore it's connected. So assume by way of contradiction that R is disconnected. Well, what does it mean for it to be disconnected? It means that we can create a separation on R. Mm -hmm. A non-empty separation. We can create a separation on R where the two sets are non-empty. So in other words, uh, I kind of said this wrong. So since it's not connected, then there exists U, V, and T in the topology on R such that U is not empty, it has something in it, U. B is not empty, it has something in it, call it B. Their intersection is empty, and their union together gives us R. Yeah. Right? And now, I'm going to call U and B, whatever those numbers are, I'm going to let U be the smaller of the two. Okay. So big U happened to be whichever set contained little u, and big V happened to be whichever set contained little v. Okay? So I know that there's U and B. I know that they're not empty, so they have at least one element in them, little u, little v. And little v is going to be whichever one is bigger out of those two. So maybe u happened to be bigger than v, just relabel in other words. With me so far? I wrote that down terribly. I shouldn't have written number two like that. But I think you understand what I'm saying now. Because you can't pick any two u and v and then say that there exist sets like this that make this true. We know that there exist sets like this that make this true, and then we know that we can take a point out of each of them and call it U and V. Yeah. And then we can relabel to make this true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yep, sorry, so that's terrible. Okay, so now consider the subspace U, V, closed interval. So I'm given this, the topology it inherits from R, this is now a subspace topology. So R is right here. We have U some point in here. V some point in here, right? So now we're looking at the subspace, the closed interval from U to V. What do open sets in the subspace look like? They look like intersections of open sets in R with this. Right. So if this is an open space in R, then the closed interval to here is an open space in this, or is an open set in the subspace. Mm -hmm. This set intersected with this gives me that. You with me? Mm -hmm. So, I know that U and V are open in R, so when I take their intersection with this set, that's going to give me two sets, U prime and V prime. You with me? Yes. So now, whatever this looks like, I know that U prime is going to be some set inside of here, and V prime is also going to be some set inside of here. Uh, can there be, so in your picture you drew that, both U prime and V prime take up all of it. Is that intentional? Like, can there be something inside that isn't neither of them? No, because U and V together have to give me all of R. Oh, okay. So every point inside this closed interval, U to V, has to be in either U or V, and therefore in either U prime or V prime. You with me? Now, yeah. these don't have to be exactly how I drew here. It could be something like this. Notice that this right here, so this to infinity union this is open in R, right? Yeah. So this clear to infinity and then this interval right here, that's open in R. Yeah. So when we intersect that with this set, that gives me this to this with this piece right here. So U prime could be this piece union with this piece and then V prime everything else. So it could be split up like that. It doesn't have to be one interval in there. Right. Okay. 
But whatever they look like, I do know that U is somewhere inside of U prime, and B is somewhere inside of B prime. Oh, no, sorry. No, it's at the edges. Yeah, at the edges. So I know that it starts with U prime and it ends with B prime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for sure there's some interval at the right side that's V prime, and for sure there's some interval at the left that's U prime. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what we know. Okay, so U prime equal to U intersect the closed interval is going to be open, and B prime equal to B intersect the closed interval is going to be open, and together those are going to form a separation of UB of this closed interval. Since big U and big B form a separation of all of R, then U prime and B prime have to form a separation of the closed interval U to B. You with me on that? Yeah. Okay. Because we know that U prime and B prime are not empty, right? Mm -hmm. We know that they don't have any elements in common, and we know that when you union them together, you get this. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're separation. All right. Uh, now this is a, there's an axiom on the real numbers that uh, you guys probably haven't heard about yet, but it's a common one that you you use in calculus, and it is called the least well. Uh, it's called the completeness axiom, and it's an axiom. It's not something you prove. What the axiom says is that if I have any bounded subset of real numbers. Bounded meaning? Bounded. So let's look at the numbers 0 to 2. Am I still on camera? I can't really see that that well, but yeah, I should still be on. So consider this subset of real numbers. Bounded meaning it doesn't go off to positive infinity or down to negative infinity. Okay. I can find a number on the right and a number on the left such that it's always between those numbers. That's a bounded subset. So here's a bounded subset of the real numbers. Now if I ask you what's the biggest thing in this set, what would you say? Two. Two's not in there. Uh, there isn't a biggest thing in that set. There isn't a biggest thing in the set. Why not? What is it? Is it 1.9? Is it 1.99? Is it 1.99999? Okay. Or we can do a quick proof. Let's assume that C is the biggest thing in there. You with me? Mm -hmm. So I know that C is between 0 and 2, and it's the biggest thing in there. Mm -hmm. Then, c plus 2 divided by 2 is also in there. And it's bigger. Okay. c is a number less than 2, right? So, here's 2, here's c. c plus 2 over 2 is the average of those two numbers. So it's right smack in the middle of them. Okay, I see. So c plus 2 over 2 is bigger than c. Right? And c is the biggest and number. And it's less than 2. So, there you go, contradiction. So C can't be the biggest thing in there. So there is no biggest thing in there. Anyways, what the least upper bound property says is, okay, so maybe you got some set that doesn't contain a largest element, but there is a least upper bound. There is something I can bound the set by that's the smallest thing you can bound it by from above. And in this case, what is it? Two. Two. Two is the smallest number I can find. That's an upper bound of everything in here. In other words, everything in here is less than two. And it's the smallest number that you can find such that everything in here is less than it. Pick any number smaller than two, then I can find something in here bigger than the number you chose. Right. Uh, for this least upper bound thing, then, wouldn't it just be always a number on the right? Well, I happen to draw a closed interval or an open interval like this. This is for any bounded subset of real numbers. I could take the rationals intersected with the interval 0 to 2, for example. And what does that give you? That just gives me all the rational numbers in there, none of the irrationals. 
Mm -hmm. And that's not an open interval like that anymore. We can't even draw what that thing is because it's a bunch of points. <laughs> and that thing again has a least upper bound. In that case, it's also two. Um, so, yeah. Anyways, so that is the axiom. The axiom is every bounded subset of real numbers has a least upper bound. Every bounded subset of real numbers for sure has an upper bound. That's obvious, right? Mm -hmm. If it's bounded, it's bounded. It has an upper bound. We're saying it has, not only does it have an upper bound, it has a least upper bound. With me? Okay. So that's an axiom on the real numbers. Uh, we have a shorthand for least upper bound. The terminology we use is called the supremum. The supremum is the least upper bound. Why we care about that, I don't know why. It's just what we say. So let C equal the supremum of U prime. Or in other words, C is the least upper bound of U prime. So whatever U prime looks like in here, it might be that in union with that thing, C is its least upper bound. Notice U prime is for sure between U and B, so it's bounded. Yeah. So it's bounded from above by B for sure. It, we're saying C is the smallest thing it's bounded from above by. It's its supremum. It's its least upper bound. You with me? Yeah. So from this picture I've drawn, since U prime is this and this, C would be the point right here in this picture. That's C. Right? Now, what I'm going to show is that C is not in U prime and C is not in B prime. Therefore, U prime and B prime are not a separation because they don't include every point, namely C. Remember, we're doing a proof by contradiction. So assume by way of contradiction that I can split this interval up into U prime, B prime, where they're open. Let C be the least upper bound of U prime, and now I'm going to show that C is not in U prime and C is not in B prime. Contradiction. Because then u prime and b prime aren't a separation of that interval. Make sense? Yeah. So that's how we're going from here. So let c be the least upper bound of u prime. Well, if c is in b prime, then. All right. Let's, I'm trying to also keep in mind that maybe draw a fresh picture really quick. Uh, so we'll draw a fresh picture here. Here's B, and then who knows what B prime looks like, but we'll just pretend it looks something like this, and then also contains that. And then here's U. So B prime is this and this to help us make sense of this. All right? You with me so far? Mm -hmm. So, uh, since... No, I think you're only going to five. Five. Since C is in B prime, then there must exist. That's supposed to be C. Then there must exist some D such that D to C is a subset of B prime. Okay, this is going to be a little bit tricky to argue uh, until it just clicks, then it will be obvious to you. Since C is in B prime, wherever it is, who knows? We'll say it's right there. Since C is in B prime, then it must be inside some basis element, right? C is in B prime. We are assuming it is, and we're going to show that leads to contradiction. If C is in B prime, then contradiction. Oh, okay. Okay, so if C is in B prime, then wherever it is, over here, over here, doesn't matter, wherever it is, it has to be in some basis element, right? Of R? Yes. Since it's in B prime, what is B prime? It's a union of basis elements in R intersected with this thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? So there has to be some small interval I can get around that point that's an open set containing it, right? Yeah. And so there has to be some D to E where C is in the middle of D and E, right? All we're going to care about is the left-hand side of this interval. What that means is that D to C, where C was some point in between them, is going to be a subset of B prime. All we care about is the left-hand side of whatever that tiny little open interval around that point is. Okay. That's what we're saying. So, uh, five. 
in season B prime, then there must have been some open interval containing C that's a subset of B prime. Furthermore, there must have been some left-hand side of that open interval containing C that's a subset of B, v prime. Yeah. You with me? I think so. And this also saves us from the complication of if C happened to be V, then it would have only had the left-hand side. So now if C is V, it's going to look like this. And if C were any other point like to the left here, we still could have found something like this. Does that make sense? Okay. So we could have always found some open interval with the left-hand side still having elements containing C. Good? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then there has to be something like this containing C where that's a subset of B prime. Well, what does that mean? That means, and then I accidentally said this again, which doesn't matter because I had it wrong the first time. So this is a subset of B prime, which means C is in there, obviously. <laughs> that made more sense if I had it how it was before. Now, since D is less than C, yeah. then the average between D and C is also between those two points. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So, I did have it right before. I can't believe that. Should have thought about more before I reached it. B, 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 all the way up to B. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. We know that C, if C is in B prime, it has to be in the first section of B prime. It can't be over here. Because it has to be greater than all the U's. It's the least upper bound of U. So if B prime is this and this, then U has to fill up this and U has to fill up this. That's right. Right? So C has to be in the first section of B. Okay, that's why it's in B. I was so confused what you were saying. Because it's not in U, it's just the least upper bound of U. We're, we're showing it's impossible for it to be in B. Right. We're still showing it's impossible for it to be in B prime. But if it is in B prime, it has to be in the first section of B prime. It can't be in one of these later sections. Yes, but you're saying if it's impossible for it to be in B prime, then that means that it's not in either U or B. Yeah. Correct. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Okay. Right. So if C is in B prime, then it has to be in this first section of B prime, right? So then there has to be some D where I can go to here such that whatever that first interval is, it, the first interval and the sum number D, who knows where it ends, but C has to be in that interval. So if C is in B prime, then there has to exist some D such that D, D to B is the first interval and is a subset of B prime, and C is in there. Yeah. With me so far? Okay. Okay. So now since C is in there, then, since D is less than C, the average point between D and C is also in there. So if C is in there, then the point that's in the middle of D and C is also in there, right? How do you know D is less than C? D, what does it mean for C? Where do we have it? What does it mean for C to be in DB? It means it's in between. That it's means D that is less than C is less than or equal to B. Same thing. Why can't it be equal? Open interval. Because it's not in the middle. Oh. That's right. Okay. Any other questions? No, I think we're good to continue. Okay. So since C is in there, then C is between B and B. Might be equal to B, but D is for sure less than C, right? So then D plus C over 2, the average point between D, the middle point between D and C, is also in there. So then D plus C over 2 is an upper bound for U prime. Notice that since it's in this first interval, this number here is bigger than everything in U prime, right? Mm -hmm. So C was the smallest number, bigger than everything in U prime. C plus D over 2 is a smaller number, bigger than everything in U prime. Contradiction. Whoa. Can you explain that a little bit more? That's cool. D plus C over 2 is less than C, right? Yeah. I, 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 I think I get what you're saying, but how, how does... By definition, 
C is the smallest number bigger than everything in U prime. What's U prime? U prime is these intervals. Yeah, the by definition, C is the smallest thing bigger than all of U prime. Oh. We assume C was in V prime, and we found another number in V prime that was, we found a smaller number in V prime that was bigger than everything in U prime. Contradiction. C is the smallest thing bigger than everything in U prime. C plus D over 2 was the number that we found bigger than everything in U prime, which is smaller than C. Contradiction. Okay. Okay. So that was handling that case. So we know that C is not in V prime. Now we need to show it's not in U prime. This one's a little bit easier. If C is in U prime, then there has to be some open interval containing C where that open interval is a subset of U prime. There has to be in some basis element. Basis element right? Mm -hmm. Since C well, and then notice, C, if C is in that interval, what does that mean? That means A is less than C is less than B, right? Yeah. Which means C plus B over 2 is also in that interval. The middle point between C and B is in this interval. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's a point in U prime. So we found a number in U prime bigger than C. Contradiction. What is C by definition? It's the, it, it's the least upper bound of U prime, but it's an upper bound of U prime, meaning everything in U prime is less, er, less than or equal to it. Right. We found something in U prime bigger than it. Contradiction. I feel like there's a lot easier way to say that, even though that's pretty simple. But couldn't you just say, uh, since it has the least upper bound, then, there, then it can't be in U prime, since it is the least upper bound? No, it can contain itself. Look at the open, or look at this interval, zero to two close. Two's in there, and it's the least upper bound. The least upper bound can be in the set, that's perfectly fine. Okay. Okay, so we just really showed that C's not in U prime and C's not in B prime. Therefore, or, so there's our contradiction. So therefore, R is connected. Because if it is disconnected, then we were able to find a point that wasn't in the separation. Contradiction. So it being disconnected led to a contradiction, therefore it's connected. Good? Mm hmm Okay. So, that just gave us so a... you're saying that R cannot be, in generally, R cannot be separated into two sets? You cannot split R into two, you can't split it into two open sets, whose union is R. And it's pretty intuitive that you can't, because if you did, somewhere along the way you'd have to have an open interval meeting with an open interval, and you'd miss the point right. where they are. Okay. And what's the point that you miss? It's the supremum of the set right here. Yeah. 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 So... Now we just really show that R with the Terran topology is connected. What do we get for free? We get for free that everything that is homeomorphic to R is also connected. And we also show that if you have two connected sets, then their cross product topology is also connected. We did that last time. If you have two yeah. connected sets, then their cross product is connected. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So what does that mean? That means R2 is connected, and everything homeomorphic to R2, and R3 is connected, and everything homeomorphic to R3. And we've been doing all these proofs all that, over the place. Is that with the standard topology you mean by Yes, R? always with the standard topology is what I'm talking about when I say R. Okay. So, quick example, now we know that S2 is connected. How do I know that S2 is connected? How do I know that S1 is connected? Oh, sorry, S1 is a circle. S2 is a circle crossed with the circle is a sphere. So this is a sphere. So I know that R is homeomorphic to an open interval 0 to 1, right? Yeah. With the standard topology. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
theorem we did last time, if the set is connected, then the closure of the set is also connected. Yeah. The closure of 0, 1 is 0, 1. Mm -hmm. There's its closure. And then 0, 1, uh, how do I want to make my connection from here? 0, 1 to a circle? Yeah, so you remember how to go from 0, 1 to a circle? You remember blooming? So we take this, here's 0, 1, and if we blue that point to that point, we get a circle. Oh, you remember going clear back to blueing? Yeah. And we would I'm use... I'm not thinking of like, just like a line circle. And we would use what was called the quotient space. So if I have this topological space, and I create a function that just assigns every point to itself, except for identifies these two points together, then I get to be the circle, right? So when we talked about a quotient space, we used a quotient map to create a quotient space. And you might not remember this, but one of the things we required of a quotient map is that it was continuous. So by definition, a quotient map is continuous. So I know already that I can create a quotient map from this space to this space. Right? Yeah. We already did that way, way, way back. We yeah. use quotient maps. Quotient maps are continuous functions. So I've got R is homeomorphic to the open interval. Mm -hmm. Since we know this is connected, we know this is connected. We know that the closure of this is connected. And then the quotient map, there's a quotient map that takes us from here to here. Quotient maps are continuous. Continuous functions preserve, con preserve connectedness. So that means that this is connected. S1's connected. And since S1 is connected. And since S1 connected, we know that cross product of connected spaces are also connected, which gives us that S2 is connected. Yeah. So the sphere is connected. That's cool. Interesting. Yeah, so once we got one space that we know is connected, and then all these spaces we've been building on that one space, it's like we an explosion of things we get for free are also connected. On your S1, is it just a circle like the outside, or is it like the whole circle kind of? Just a boundary. A circle is just a boundary. A disk is what we call what's filled in. Okay. So how do you get a sphere from S1 cross S1? To every point on us. the outside, right? Oh, sorry. Surface, right? Sorry, sorry, sorry. How did we get the sphere? Because that is not S1 cross S1. S1 cross S1 is the torus. If I have a circle, and to every point on the circle I identify a circle, I assign a circle, uh, I'm yeah. going to end up with the donut, yeah. the torus. So that S2 is not S1 cross S1. We're going to get the sphere again later, but what was the author's justification for this meaning? Uh, we don't even need to find it. We'll, we'll prove again here in a second that the sphere is... Maybe he just introduced it to talk about, and then said we're going to show it later. But we'll show it anyways. Maybe he had some other way of doing it, but we'll but show it again right here. S2 is the sphere. S2 is the sphere, yes. S1 is the circle, S2 is the sphere. All right, so the important thing, though, note that here we got R, or we got that the closed interval 0 to 1 is connected, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Now, we use in this class big I to denote this interval. Right. Okay? So, since I cross, that's a cross, I is connected. I know I is connected, therefore I cross I is connected, right? Mm -hmm. And I cross I is a square. That's I cross I, right? Yeah, it's unit one, right? Yeah, unit square. The size doesn't really matter in its topology. Yeah. But, now I know that all the quotient maps that we apply to this thing also give us connected spaces. And we started representing our quotient maps this way instead of actually writing out the functions. So what happens when I take the square and I identify this side with this side? Cylinder. Almost cylinder, but flattened out. It's called the annulus, right? Cylinder, but flattened out. Yeah, because remember in topology, we can stretch however we want. So if I take this thing, Take the square, and I identify this side with this side, you get the cylinder just like you want, right? Mm -hmm. 
But now imagine that it's really stretchy material. I can stretch out the top and flatten it out, keeping my bottom the same size, and I end up with an annulus. But isn't that connected? The annulus looks like this. Would this feel like Michael Washer? Yeah, Michael Washer. Yeah, it's connected. Because it's the result, this and this are the same thing, it's the result of what? Of applying a quotient map to the connected space. And the quotient map is continuous. So here's the annulus, the Mobius strip or the Mobius band. Yeah. Is also a connected space. The torus. Yeah. Do you see how that gives you the torus? Yeah, see that better than the angle. <laughs> Identify this. Oh, that's quite a while. Can't do that one. Identify this with this. Gives me that, right? Mm -hmm. Now identify this end with this end. So bring it around and hook it on. Right. You got the surface of a donut. Torus. Uh, Quay bottle. Can't do that one. Sorry. You have to have four dimensions of space to do that. But when we saw it in three dimensions, there's that bottle that like intersected with itself yeah. on the surface, and it only had one side. Like you could keep your finger, if you could reach through the object, you could keep your finger on one side of it and get from the outside. It doesn't have any outside or inside, is what we say. Right. No difference between the outside and the inside. The same way that the Mobius strip only has one side, the Klein bottle only has one inside versus outside. That's cool. Uh, and then here's the sphere. Okay. So the sphere, we identify all these points together. Oh yeah. And we identify all these points together. What do you mean identify points together? Like all same. these points are now the same point. Okay. So we reduce all those to the same point A. We reduce all those to the same point B. And now we're identifying this with this, like that. So now you've got that disc, and you need to identify this side with this side. If you take a disc and reach around and close it, you're gonna end up with a sphere. And then uh, the projected plane, this was the really funky looking sphere that like intersected itself. I didn't even try drawing this one, I just showed you the picture of it. Because, yeah, you can't even do this, because you got like a Mobius band going, <laughs> and then you make the edges all the same point. This isn't, identify those are the same point and those are the same point. That's that point and that point are the same point. So over here, these were two different points. That was point A, that was point B. Here we've got something like this. How do you even do that? A, this is the same point A, and we switch the direction here. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't seem possible. <laughs> what do you mean it seems possible? Are you going to create a quotient map that does that? Easy as pie. There you go, you did it. What does it look like when you try to picture that as some three-dimensional like information? Who cares? <laughs> You're right that you cannot use three dimensions of space to get this object yeah. from a square. I don't know. I assume you can do it with four dimensions. I don't know. But yeah, when you try to do it, you get a weird pinch intersecting point that's awkward too. That's why I didn't even bother trying to draw it. But that's one of the ones I told you guys to go look at uh, videos yeah. generating it and try to figure out why they call this thing the projected plane. Because. It's not going to make intuitive sense unless you watch renderings of it, and then there's some good modeling out there. Helps it appeal to you. You remember looking at the Klein bottle? Yeah. Yeah, that one's cool too. All right, let's move this over and finish up the blackboard. Don't let me go onto the whiteboard without moving my camera. Just a little bit of it. I have to keep my brightness way down on my phone so I can. Make my battery last. No clue how much battery I got left. iPhones. Okay. Punctured plane now. You remember what the punctured plane is? It's like the plane but remove the origin. Oh yeah, it's like that huge plane but it has like a little thing. In it. Just one hole in it. Yep. So how are we going to prove that the punctured plane? is connected, which it is. Well. Here's what we know. If I take the half plane, 
That's the same as R2. Mm -hmm. The half plane is homeomorphic to R2. Yeah. So therefore, the half plane is connected. So I can take the half plane, and I can take the other half plane here. So now they're just missing that one vertical line, right? But now I know that when I have, if I have a set, I can include its limit points, its boundary points, and it's still connected. The theorem we had last time wasn't just that the closure is connected. That's the case. Closure is connected, but we said for any set, if A is connected, then any set S that satisfies this is also connected. So what would the closure of the half plane look like? The closure of the half plane would be including all these points, right? Uh -huh. But I don't have to include all of them. I can include any number I want. As long as my set S is between these two, it's still connected. So I can take the half plane removing just this point and it's still connected. You with me? Mm -hmm. That's what we proved last time. So I'm going to do that with this plane and with this plane so that they're both missing that point. You with me? Mm -hmm. Now I still need to justify that the union of those things together is connected. But well, we already proved that if two connected sets have an intersecting point, picking in those boundary points that they included, if two intersecting sets are connected, then their union is connected. So since these are two both connected by themselves, and since they have a point in common, namely one of their boundary points, then their union is connected. You with me there? Yeah. And intuitively, hopefully that makes sense, if we remove one point from R2, it's not somehow disconnected. We need to remove like a whole line from R2 to disconnect it into two separate things. Yeah. Okay. Definition. Let X, T be some topological space that's connected. From R2 though, but if you did that to R, just R, then it would be disconnected. From R, if we just remove one point, it's now disconnected. Yeah. Yeah. So let X, T be some topological space such that it's connected then a set S, that's a subset of X, is called a cut set, provided that X minus S is disconnected. So X is connected. If by removing the set S, I get something disconnected, then S is called a cut set. In other words, removing S cut the set into two separate pieces. So it would be like an R2 taking out a whole line. Like an R2 taking out a whole line that cuts the set in two. So the line would be a cut set. Okay. okay? If for a single point P in X, the set containing P is a cut set, so if P all by itself gives you a cut set, then we call the point P a cut point. So in R, yeah. if I remove one point, then that now splits R into two, right? Mm -hmm. And so that point is a cut point. Okay. Uh, a cut set or a cut point is said to separate X. It separates the set. Just basic terminology that works exactly how you expect to. Alright, uh, S1 is a cut set of R2 with the standard topology. Let's make sense of that. So I've got R2 up here, and we'll just think about the plane. What is S1? It's just a circle. So if I take out these points from R2, the points on the boundary of the circle, I just split R2 into two open sets. The outside of the circle and the inside of the circle. Yeah, okay. So S is a cut set in R2, just as an example. Uh, we already talked about this. Pick any point in R you want, then it's a cut point. Mm -hmm. That splits R into negative infinity to P, P to infinity for any point P. Those would be yeah. the two open sets. Uh, no point in R2 is a cut point. If I have R2 and I just remove one point, it doesn't split R2 into two separate open sets, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what about S1? Does S1 have any cut points? Yes. So we got S1. No, it doesn't. Where's its cut point? It's just one continuous piece. Oh. If I remove any point from it, then we're left with the interval, an open interval, which is connected. So removing one point from S1 just gives you back an open interval. We already know open intervals are connected. Therefore, no point on S1 is a cut point. 
If you were to remove two points, so then it would be, yes? Yes, because removing one point gives us something homeomorphic to R, and we already know that every point in R is a cup point. So, if P and P prime are in S1 such that P is not equal to P prime, then the set containing those two is a cut set. Yeah. I was going to ask that, but it looks like you realized it before we uh, got there. So, I feel like you're getting intuition for what a connected space is and what a uh, disconnected space is and what a cut set is. Yeah. Right? Okay. And that's what all these are for, is just building examples. Examples that you're already comfortable with. Okay. Uh, Quick theorem, this was very intuitive. Let f from x to y be a homeomorphism. So what is f? It's one to one, it's on to, it's continuous, and its inverse is continuous. Tons of structure in a homeomorphism. Let f from x to y be a homeomorphism. If s is a cut set in x, then f of s is a cut set in y. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, very intuitive so here. Not only does mapping a disconnected set map to a disconnected set, but they have the exact same cut set. The way the cut set map is also the same. So you have to do a little bit of work to prove it. It's not something that you quite have for free, but it's very intuitive. My proof looks kind of long, but it's very straightforward. So let S be a cut set of X. Since X is connected, then Y is connected, right? Mm -hmm. Since x minus s is disconnected, because s is a cut set, yeah. so x minus s is disconnected, what does that mean? That means that there are just two sets, u and b, such that their union is equal to x minus s. Their intersection is empty, and neither of the sets themselves are empty. Just a basic separation. So then what is f of x minus s? It is equal to, I don't know why I did some sense here, it is equal to f of u union b, this is the same exact set as that, right? Mm -hmm. Which is equal to f of u union f of b. So notice now, <laughs> f of, it's equal to f of u union f of b. Now notice that I know that f of u intersect f of b is empty. How do I know that? Because u and b don't have any elements in common. So since f is 1 to 1, then f of u and f of b can't have any elements in common. Okay. Yeah. Right? Similarly, f of u is not equal to f of b, and neither of them are empty. u wasn't empty, so it mapped to something, so f of u is not empty. b wasn't empty, so it mapped to something, so f of b is not empty. And then obviously they're not the same set because they don't have any elements in common. So neither of them is empty. And then last thing to note, f of u is open. How do I know f of u is open? Because uh, u is open. So how does u being open lead to f of u being open? Because u union b is open. Because f is continuous. It's a homeomorphism, but the property we cared about there is continuous. Since f is continuous, oh no, a homeomorphism, because the inverse is continuous. Yeah. yeah, you're right. So since f is a homeomorphism, not just continuous, but homeomorphism, then that means the image of open sets are also open. So u is open, so f of u has to be open. v was open, so f of v has to be open. So we found two sets, f of u, f of v, such that this is true, and this is true, and f of u union, f of v, is equal to f of x minus s, but notice that, well, we'll just say right here. I'm trying to tie it together here, but I tied it together right now. Therefore, f of u comma f of v is a separation of f of x minus s, which is the same thing as, as f of x minus f of s, which is the same thing as y minus f of s. Yeah. Right? Because this is equal to f of u minus f of v, or union f of v. Right here. f of x minus s is equal to f of u union f of v. And f of x minus s is equal to f of x minus f of x is equal to f of x is y because the function is on 2 minus f of s, which is still f. So there's our separation. Makes sense. So we found this, 
This was a separation using this set, therefore f of s is a cut set on y. Good? Alright, uh, here's one that's more interesting and even easier to prove. If this is a topological space and is connected, and if A is a subset of X such that its interior isn't empty, and the interior of its complement isn't empty, then the border of it is a cut set. So let's draw a picture really quick. Here's X. Oh, I think I see what you're saying. It's like the Here's A. Here's the border of A. Okay. I'm saying that the border of A, the boundary of A, sorry, boundary of A is what we called it, is always a cut set. Yeah. As long as A, the inside of A, wasn't empty, and the outside out here wasn't empty. Is a cut set between X and A, right? Is a cut set on X. What are the two open sets going to be? The interior of A and everything outside of it. Yeah. It's the exact same thinking that we use with a circle, but now this is way more generic. We don't have to be talking about a circle in R2. This is for any set. Right. Okay. But it's the same intuition as for a circle. So you remember what the interior of A is? A when the circle above it is the interior. So if we're talking about for a disk, what's the interior of a disk? It's this. Mm -hmm. So let, let me just draw a set. Let's say that A looked like this. So we included some boundary points, but not all of them. So here's A. Then over here is A interior. A closure is the whole thing. This is A closure. And then the boundary is the closure minus the interior, which just gives me the outer circle. So A included all the points in here. This right here is the boundary of A. Just the circle. Nothing inside, nothing outside. So if A is a set that looks like this, has all the points inside, some of the boundary points, but not all of them. The interior is everything inside without the boundary points. The closure is everything inside and all the boundary points. And then the boundary is the closure minus the interior. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, so now, when we read this one more time, I think that this will make intuitive sense and the proof's for you. If X tau is a connected topological space and A is a subset of X such that its interior isn't empty and the interior of its closure, or of its complement is empty, meaning the interior of everything not in A. Mm -hmm. Meaning there is an open set outside of A that's not empty. At least one. That's another way that you can think about that thing. Then, the boundary of A is a cut set. Okay? So let X be connected and let A be some subset of X such that the property is then x minus the boundary of A is equal to x minus the boundary of A. The closure minus the interior is a boundary, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if we start with x and we get rid of the closure and we put back the interior, x minus this minus this is going to be kind of like x plus the interior, right? Minus the closure plus the interior, kind of. Okay. It's going to be x remove the closure, but then put back the interior. x remove the closure. Oh, I see what you're saying. Parentheses here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then put back the interior. Mm -hmm. With me? Now, x minus the closure is the same thing as the closure's complement. That up there would be period for this. The closure's complement. So the closure's complement is everything outside of the closure of the set, everything out here. So the closure's complement, that's exactly what that is, right? Union, the interior. Yeah. So x minus the boundary is equal to these two. We know that the closure of a set is always closed. The complement of a closed set is Open. What's the definition of a closed set? A set whose complement is open. Yeah. That's its definition. So we already know that every closed, every closure is closed. So since a closure is closed, its complement is open. Mm -hmm. And the interior of A, that's the union of all the open sets containing A, is obviously open. So here's two open sets that are equal to 
x minus delta a. x minus to the border of a, the boundary of a. Right. Two open sets that equal that. That's a separation. We just divided it into two. Oh. Yeah. So oh. this was a cut set. Don't lose track of what we're doing. Okay. That's what we were trying to show. That x minus this thing can be expressed as the union of two open sets. Which can be. Make sense? Yeah. Alright, let's get into the calculus stuff now. Yes, the intermediate value theorem. Not all the way on the right. Yeah. Okay, IVT, intermediate value theorem. That's what the next section is called, because it's all about the intermediate value theorem. So here's the intermediate value theorem from calculus. It's very intuitive, uh, so let's just go over it. Let f from some closed interval a, b to r be continuous. So f might be a function. We define it from a to b, so it's only defined on this interval, and it's continuous. With me so far? Mm -hmm. So the domain is a closed interval a, b. So let f from a, b to r be continuous, and let c be any point between f of a and f of b. So f of a is this height, f of b is this height, c is just any point between those. Which one doesn't matter? Just some point between them. With me so far? Yeah. What the intermediate value theorem says is that then there exists some point between A and B, call it X naught, such that the height of X naught is C. So pick any point between F of A and F of B. I can find a point between A and B such that F of that point gives me the point over here. Okay, but why do we care? Why do we care? We'll see some application of this. Oh, okay. But this is a very, very useful property. We use it all the time. Why are we not proving it? We're going to prove a topological version of this, which is more general. Oh, okay. This is just very intuitive, easy to... Hopefully this appeals to your intuition is obviously that's true, almost. Mm -hmm. Right? Now notice it says that there exists some x naught that makes this true. It doesn't say that there's only one. Notice that there's two points here. I could have used this point, its height is c, and this point, its height is c. The function kind of goes up and past. Right. It just tells us that there's at least one that makes this true. That's all it tells us. Intermediate value theorem. Very useful thing. Use it all the time. This theorem, so here's the calculus version. We'll prove a more general version. But this theorem has an immediate corollary that is also very useful. So let f from a, b to r be continuous such that f of a and f of b have opposite signs. So I have no clue what this thing looks so like. One's positive and one's negative. But one's positive and one's negative. I don't know which one's which. So it starts at a, ends at b, and whatever this function does, it either starts negative and ends positive, or starts positive and neg ends negative. We'll just draw it like this. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Right. So f of a is down here, f of b is up here. Well, what that means is that the function achieves a value of zero somewhere in between. Yes. That's using the intermediate value theorem. Notice what that gives you. How often in your basic algebra classes were you trying to solve an equation of the form f of x equals to zero? Trying to find the roots of an equation is what we often call that. Tons of times. How did you know that you could even find that root? How did you know that such a root even existed? Intermediate value theorem is what guarantees that there is some root that gives us that. I'm a little lost for which. We did that at the end of our algebra course. You solve the equation of the form like this. x squared is equal to 4, right? Yeah. Which is logically equivalent to finding the solution to x squared minus 4 equals 0. Which we call finding the roots of that polynomial. Where is this polynomial 0? That's its roots. Mm -hmm. How do you know that there is a solution to that equation? In this case, you were able to find it, mm -hmm. right? But I could have also given you something like this. And maybe that one you struggle with a little bit more. And how do you know you can even find that thing? What does that mean? X to the 5 ninths equals 4. Does that thing have a solution? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And so you would rewrite it like this. X to the 5 ninths minus 4 equals 0. 
And now you just need to see, are the, can I find a point where this thing's positive and a point where this thing's negative? And if you can, then there has to be a point where it's zero. Okay. And so there is a solution. Now, whether or not you can find it is another question, but hey, it means at least you're not wasting your time looking for one. So this is something we use all the time, and a lot of times it's for that exact thing. Let's make sure that the equation even has a solution before I waste my time trying to find out what the solution is. And it comes from this corollary. So if f is a continuous function on a, b, such that f of a and f of b have opposite sign, then there exists some point between them such that the value at that point is zero, which makes you know how you'd prove this if you have this, right? That's pretty straightforward? Yeah. Okay. And we'll even prove something similar to it here in a second. All right. So that was calculus. That's something that we do in calculus. You guys haven't taken calculus, so this is more for like an MO here. Most people taking to quality have taken calculus, so it's good to have that throwback. But you'll be seeing this take next year, hopefully. Negative. Yeah. You know, it's very, very strange to be taking to quality before you're taking calculus. Really? You're the first person on earth to do that. Why? Uh, it's much more advanced material. Really? It, well, it makes sense. It's yes. Hard stuff much for me to advanced. understand. It is hard to understand, but I don't think you need like a background in calculus. You don't. It's a separate field of mathematics. But calculus is considered an easier class by far than topology. In fact, calculus is considered an easier course by far than discrete math. Really? Yes. If you don't struggle with like a college algebra really course, you're not really going to struggle with calculus course. What I do for calculus isn't what you take in college for calculus. They call that real analysis, which is back on par with topology. So what you're doing next year is just calculus. It's just calculus. Yep. Hmm. Okay. That's kind of. Yeah. Interesting. Calculus are still what we call the thing. Do you to take an algebra course for me? College algebra. You never really had a complete algebra course. So. Yeah, it's still one I want to do. And could have a lot more fun with it. Like, if they don't let me do what I want to do next year, one thing I'm seriously considering doing is a, a linear algebra course. What What is that? It's it's the same thing as algebra that you're used to, but the algebra that you're used to is just algebra on the real numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, linear algebra is doing algebra on vectors. So a vector is an ordered collection, the same way that we talk about lists in uh, discrete math. Mm. You can think about as a vector. That's good intuition. So doing algebra now on lists rather than just one real number. And you can think about a, number, a real number as just a one element list. Mm -hmm. Right? So then if you do linear algebra and you limit yourself to uh, single vectors, then you're back to regular algebra that you're used to. So I might do that. Another fun one would be trig. I don't really want to teach trig. I mean, I, I would teach trig, but I want to teach trig people I taught geometry to. I want that to be uh, something I build up to. I don't want to be, if you don't know geometry, now come take trig for me so I can teach you geometry. May as well just teach you geometry. I see. So. Except I don't think I'm as committed to geometry as I was to topology. Yeah, geometry would be a fun one to do again. It that, would be fun. That book is so great. Anyways, let's keep going before this dies, and then we can talk after my camera's dead. It hasn't died already. Yeah, I got the screen as dark as it does, so hopefully that helps. Okay, so uh, let's actually prove now the topology version of the intermediate value theorem. And let's read what it says first. Let x be connected, and let f be a function from x to r. So f now is a function from any connected set to r. We didn't have to limit ourselves to going from some subspace of r to r. Right. We can go from any connected function, or any connected topological space to r now. So let x be connected and let f be from any connected topological space to r, and let it be continuous. Same way we had to be so continuous up here. So if, if the function is continuous, then it's connected? If the domain is connected, and the function is continuous, then the image is connected. Okay. Continuous functions preserve connectedness. But we already know that R is connected. So 
So you can have a connected function and neither of them be connected. Connected is connected. a topological property. A connected function doesn't make sense. A continuous function makes sense. Well, what I'm saying is you can have a continuous function and you can have what neither of the set be connected. Yeah. 100% right. Hmm. Uh, a really simple example would be uh, take the trivial topology with the identity function on itself. So take this topology, doesn't matter what x is, x, empty set, and do the identity function. Oh, that's still connected. Sorry, you said disconnected, right? Mm -hmm. So, in that example, you would do x and then the power set on x. Where x has more than one element. And then the identity function. Because then, since basically everything's open, any way you split it, it's always going to give you separation. So you just need to make sure it has at least two elements, so you have two elements to separate, and then separate them. It's connected. Anyways, uh, so let's go over this. Uh, let x be connected, and let f from x to r be continuous. If a and b are points in x such that f of a is less than f of b, notice f of a is a real number now. So we can't compare a and b. Those are things in x. Right. doesn't make sense to say one's greater than the other. But f of a less than f of b, we can say that because now we're in r. Mm -hmm. So if a and b are in x such that f of a is less than f of b, then for any c you choose in the closed interval from f of a to f of b, notice this is real numbers now, yeah. for any real number you choose between f of a and f of b, possibly equal to them, but between them, okay. then there exists some x not in x such that f of x not gives you that c. It can't be. C can't be equal to them. It can be. If C but is equal to F of A, then A is the thing in X that maps to it. If oh. C is equal to F of B, then B is the thing in X that maps to it. Yeah. And then if C is anything in between, we're going to find the X that maps to it. Show that there is one. Make sense? Yeah. And we're going to say exactly what you just said real quick. Now, uh, right here. No, if c is equal to f of a or c is equal to f of b, we're done. What's the a such that f of a, or what's the point such that f of that point gives you c? A. Notice we're looking for something in x. We're looking for x not in. We're looking for x not in x such that f of x not is equal to c. That's what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. We're finding the x not that makes this true. If C is equal to F of A, then A is the X naught that makes it true. Yeah. Yeah. And if C is equal to F of B, then B is the X naught that makes it true. So we're done in those two cases. Now we gotta handle the case where C is between F of A and F of B. You with me so far? Yeah. So we've handled the edge case of C is equal to F of A or C is equal to F of B. Now assume that C is between F of A and F of B. Because we've handled the case where it's equal. Mm -hmm. Observe that since x is connected, and since f is continuous, then f of x is connected in R. Yeah. Continuous functions preserve connectedness. Yeah. Okay. Assume by way of contradiction that c is not in f of x. Or in other words, there's nothing in x such that it maps to c. Assume that C is not in the image, this is big X, sorry. Why wouldn't you just say C is not in X? C is a real number. It's in our image. C is over here. So, but you're saying C isn't in the real numbers because F of X is the real numbers. So F maps big X to R, but not necessarily to all of R. It might only map it to the numbers 5, 7, and 22. Right? Yeah. So if x, if f maps x to only the numbers 5, 7, and 22, then the intermediate value theorem does not hold. Because 21 is a number between 5 and 22, and it's not in the image. Good. 
Here's what we're saying. If f is continuous, and x is connected, mm -hmm. and a and b are any two points in the real numbers that I know f maps to, then f also has to map to every number in between them. Oh, because it's continuous. Is that why? No. We're showing that... Why does it have to map to every number in between them? Because x is connected and it's continuous. Those two together give us that. So up here, it felt obvious when we were working with the real numbers, just because we're used to our intuition about continuous functions, you can't pick it up. Okay, a continuous function from any connected topology now to R also satisfies the intermediate value theorem, which is in no way obvious. Okay. Here's the intuition for it. What do connected sets look like in R? They look like intervals. They have to be continuous intervals. I can't have them jumping like this, right? Otherwise, it's not connected. I can split it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if this is connected, then its image has to be some connected thing like this. It can't have other parts to it. So if f of a is in its image, and if f of b is in its image, and I know that its image is connected, then all the points between them also have to be in its image. That makes sense. Yeah, there's the intuition for it. That's what we're proving. Okay. And notice that we didn't need the, the domain to be R to prove it. We just need the domain to be connected. If the domain is connected topology, that's enough. Okay. Okay. So let's start again and remember where all our numbers are coming from. So F is a function from X to R, and it's continuous. We pick two points in X, A, B. This is an X, not an R. They map to two real numbers, f of a and f of b. We're calling b the one that maps to the bigger number of the two. So we're labeling them such that f of a is less than f of b. Mm -hmm. But those are real numbers. What's bigger out of a and b? We don't know. We don't, that, that question doesn't make sense. But what's bigger out of f, and a, f of a and f of b does make sense. Those are real numbers. We can compare those. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Then, for any C you choose between these two, including them, obviously, but between them as well, for any point between them you choose C, so let's draw our domain over here. A was a point over here, B is a point over here, here's X. We know that F maps from X over here to the real numbers, right? Mm -hmm. So I know it maps A to here, I know it maps B to here. I'm saying for any number C you find here, there has to be some x naught somewhere in the domain. Who knows where it is? X naught, it's that point right there, such that f of x naught is C. equal to C. Okay. For every C. For any C you choose, I can find something over here at x such that it maps to that C you chose. Okay. As long as the C you chose is between f of a and f of b. Right. Okay. So. We let C be any number between f of A and f of B. Now notice, if C is f of A, then A maps to it. If C is f of B, then B maps to it. Right. So those two, that case, trivial. We're done. Now what about the case where C isn't equal to f of A and isn't equal to f of B? Then it has to be somewhere between them. Right? So then C is between f of A and f of B. Mm -hmm. Okay. Observe that since x is connected, and since f is continuous, then f of x has to be connected. Whatever, if I take all of x and I map it, who knows what that looks like? That could look like this. And that could be from here all the way to here. This whole thing could be f of x. Whatever it is, it's connected. Uh -huh. So r goes on forever, but f of x is just this section. Because the continuous function preserves connectedness. Because the continuous function preserves connectedness. And connected things in the real numbers look like solid intervals. Yeah. So whatever this f of x is, it has to be a solid interval. Can't have any holes in it. Yeah. Otherwise, it would be connected. So, since x is connected and since f is continuous, then f of x is connected in R. Yeah. Assume by way of contradiction that c isn't in f of x. So now we're going to say, what happens if I remove c from f of x? If I put a hole there? Then it's disconnected. Then I just barely made f of big x disconnected. Yeah. Which is exactly what I'm going to say. So assume by way of contradiction that C isn't in there, 
Then I just barely split R down the middle into everything over here and everything over here. What's everything over here? This is negative infinity to C. This is the point C, right? Mm -hmm. And everything over here, that is C to infinity. Yeah. Right? So if C isn't in F of X, then negative infinity to C intersected with F of X and C to infinity intersected with F of X are a separation on F of X. Yep. Contradiction. Contradiction. Therefore, F of X is not connected. Contradiction. Therefore, C is in F of X. And since C is in F of X, what does that mean? If C is in the image of the function, that means there was something that mapped to it. Otherwise, yeah. how could it be in the image of the function? Right. Make sense? Yeah. Wonderful. Intermediate value theorem, topology style. And then, the intermediate value theorem from calculus is comes for free. Because that's just one special case, right? So yeah. That's when you replace that x with r. It works for any connected topological space. R is a connected topological space. Therefore, duh, it works. Okay. Uh, let's see a cold little consequence of this. Uh, let f be a function from negative 1 to 1 and 2 negative 1 to 1. So if we graph this function, it's a continuous function defined from negative 1 to 1. And whatever the image of this function looks like, I know it's always between negative 1 and 1. So it might start right here and go like this. Who knows? But it's a continuous function whose domain is negative 1 to 1 and whose image is a subset of negative 1 to 1. So it could have looked like that. It could have looked like this. It could have looked like, I think you get the point. Yeah. Any yeah. continuous function I can draw starting at negative 1, ending at 1, staying between negative 1 and 1 in the horizontal direction, or vertical direction. Okay, that's what we're saying. Let f be any function like that that's continuous. Then there has to be some point in the function, some point in the domain, such that the value of the function equals its input. The output equals the input. So let me draw one example up here, and we'll try and guess where the point might be just by eyeballing it. So we have negative 1, we have 1, we have negative 1, we have one. So I draw some function. It might look like this. Right? Mm -hmm. So we're saying somewhere along there, the x and y of the function are the same. Now where are the x and the y the same? The x and y are the same along this line. Right? That's the line y equals x. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Y equals x, or f of x equals x, right? All along this line, the x and y values are the same. I see. So right here on the other function, it's x and y were the same. However far this way we are, we're the same high. However far this way we are, we're the same high. However far this way we are, we're the same high. So what we're saying is basically this function has to intersect this line somewhere. It has to? Yeah. At least once. At least once. Okay. Which makes it two to cents, right? Let's draw it one more time. And let's set up a challenge problem for you that it'll be obvious to your brain that you can't get past it. Rather than going from negative one to one, I'm just gonna go from zero to one. Same principle. Okay. So if I draw the function like this. So here's one, here's one, and I draw a line through here. This is the line y equals x, right? Yep. That's terrible. That's still terrible, but I think you get it. There's line y equals x. Now I tell you, draw a continuous function. You have to start at f of 0, and you have to go to f of 1, and you have to stay between 0 and 1. And make sure it doesn't intersect this line. 
Yes. So start anywhere on this line that you want, and draw over until you reach this line anywhere you want. You can't pick up your pencil. Can't you just start at zero? Start at zero. We already intersected it. Where? At zero. Oh, okay. <laughs> start up here. Uh, oh, I'm getting close to the runway, runway. Uh, <laughs> I have to get there. Right? No way to avoid it. You're going to intersect that line somewhere. That is essentially what we're saying. Oh, yeah. So somewhere along the line, the input and the output are going to be the same value. F of C is going to equal C. And you're proving that? Yeah, that's what we're proving. Huh. Okay. So let's do it. Let F from negative 1 to 1 be continuous and define G by G of X is equal to F of X minus X. With me so far? Yes. Now, notice f of x continuous, right? Mm -hmm. Is x by itself continuous? Yes, every polynomial is continuous. Yeah. Uh, you might not remember, this is going too far back and it's not worth rehashing out. Uh, but this function right here we now know is continuous. Since this is continuous and since this is continuous, the whole thing is continuous. Okay. So g is a continuous function, is all we're getting at. Okay. So g is a continuous function. So observe that g is continuous. g of negative 1 is equal to, what's g of negative 1? When we plug negative 1 in for g, what do we get? We get f of negative 1 minus negative 1. f of negative 1 minus negative 1. Yeah. Which is f of negative 1 plus 1. Right? Yeah. Now notice that f, its image, is bound between 1 and negative 1. So actually... The biggest it can be is 1... And the smallest it can be is negative 1. Right? Mm -hmm. So, since the smallest it can be is negative 1, then this value right here, f of negative 1 plus 1, is always greater than or equal to 0. Yeah. Because the smallest this can be is negative 1. It can be bigger than negative 1, but the smallest it can be is negative 1. So when you plus 1 to it, the smallest value you can possibly get is 0. Okay. With me? Mm -hmm. Similarly, g of 1 is equal to f of 1 minus 1 is always less than or equal to 0. The biggest this can be is 1, and so when we subtract 1 from it, you're either going to get 0 or something smaller than 0. Right. Okay. Notice that if f of negative 1 is equal to negative 1, or f of 1 is equal to 1, then g of negative 1 is equal to 0, or g of 1 is equal to 0. The point is, g is 0 if one of these is true. I'm going to show no matter what, g is 0 somewhere. So if one of these is true, then g is 0. Otherwise, if f of negative 1 is not equal to negative 1, and f of 1 is not equal to 1, then g of negative 1 is greater than 0, and g of 1 is less than 0. In other words, two points with opposite signs, right? Yeah. Which means that there exists some point in between where it's 0. In either case, there exists x not in there such that g of x not equals 0. What does it mean for g of x not to equal 0? Remember what g of x is. g of x is f of x minus x. So if g of x not is equal to 0, that's the same thing as f of x not minus x not equals 0, which is the same thing as f of x not equals x not. See that? Mm -hmm. Nice and easy. All right. This last one, really cool. Is the camera still going? Uh, yeah. Cool. All right, this last problem, super cool. Uh, let's go over the proof real quick and then we'll see. It might not be obvious to you why, why it's cool until we explain after the fact. Maybe I'll say what we're proving, tell you why it's cool, and then go through the proof. <laughs> so let f be a function whose domain is the surface of a sphere. Yeah. And whose image is the real numbers. With me so far? Mm -hmm. So let f, like that, be continuous. Then there exists some point on the sphere such that the value at that point is equal to the value on the opposite side of the sphere. Are you saying? It's a bit to take in at first. Remember, the domain of a function is a sphere. We are proving that there exist two points on opposite sides of the sphere, 
such that when you plug them into the function, they get the same value, okay. as long as the function is continuous. Yeah. You with me? Yeah. All right, let's see some quick uh, results that follow from that. What that means is two points on opposite sides of the Earth have the same temperature, pressure, elevation, humidity. Think about this. Think about a temperature function for every point on the surface of the Earth. As the temperature changes from point to point, that's going to be a continuous function, however I map that, right? Uh, you have a thermometer. Yeah. Now, there are a trillion Peters all over the surface of the Earth. At every point on Earth, there's a Peter standing there with a thermometer. Okay. That is the value of our function at that point, whatever the thermometer reads. Yeah. That function, how it changes, as I go from Peter to Peter, is going to be a continuous change. It's going to be a nice, smooth, gradual, continuous change. Yeah. Right? Okay. What that means is, there are two Peters somewhere on opposite sides of the Earth measuring the exact same temperature. How? Not any two Peters on opposite sides of the Earth are measuring the same temperature. Yeah. We're saying there exists two Peters on opposite sides well, of the Earth. Exactly who opposite, have right? Exactly opposite. They are on exact opposite sides of the Earth, and they are measuring the same temperature. Wait. So the temperature is the exactly the same. The Earth's not a perfect sphere. Within a reasonable margin of error. The temperature is the exact same at two points on opposite sides of the Earth. Always. That point can change as time goes on, but there are always two points on opposite sides of the Earth where the temperature is exactly the same. There so, exists at least one. That yeah, one set of two points. So not everybody... Not any, yeah, if I, oh, I'm okay. standing here, I measure the temperature, go to the opposite side of the Earth, no, it's not going to be the same temperature, most likely. But there are two points on the Earth that are opposite from each other, where the temperature is exactly the same. Yeah. Similarly, measure the elevation everywhere, how high you are above sea level. Do that all over the Earth. There are two points on opposite sides of the Earth that have the exact same elevation. That would make sense. I mean, it's cool, but... You're going to prove that, right? <laughs> yeah, we're going to prove this, and the proof is not that hard. So I just want you to see why this is just so cool, because it seems like something like, that's a really hard thing to say, a really hard thing to prove, and yet the proof is just so simple. <laughs> Amazing, right? Yeah. The apology is so good. <laughs> All right, so let's do the nice, simple little proof. Five-liner. One of those applications of the intermediate value theorem. Nice. So let f from s2 to r be continuous. Notice we already talked about the fact that s2 is continuous. connected. 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 Yes. S2 is connected. connected. Oh, that's, that's what we're proving. Sorry, come down here. Let f from s2 to r be continuous. Well, and let s2 and r are continuous. Let f from s2 to r be continuous. We already know that s2 is connected. And r is and we already know that R is connected for Sarah's body, yep. Okay. And let G from S2 to R by G of X is equal to F of X minus F of negative X. Now, what is X? X is a point on the sphere. Okay? Yeah. Negative X is a point on the opposite side of the sphere. Yeah. With me? Yeah. Okay. So... If f of x minus f of negative x is 0, then these two gave me the same value. So that would be two points on opposite sides of the sphere gave the same value. Yeah. So I have g of x equal to this difference. If g of x is 0, we're done. And I'm going to show that g of x is 0 somewhere. Okay. You with me? Yeah. Okay. So observe that s2 is connected, and that g of x is equal to negative g of negative x. That's what this is going to be saying. We're just doing a bit of algebra in between. And I think if you look at it coming up both sides and then make the middle step make sense, that's the easiest way to see it. So what is g of x? Well, g of x is just f of x minus f of negative x, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what is negative g of negative x? That's going to be negative f of negative x. Neg put the negative on the whole outside and then plug negative x inside. Okay? Mm -hmm. So negative g of negative x is negative, and here's g of negative x. Plug negative x in for x to this, and you get this. Okay. You see that? Yeah. Okay. Now, 
We're just going to cancel out our negatives and see that we get this, and then we'll see how that seems out. So applying the negative to this gives me this. And then negative negative x is just x. And negative negative is just x. And then from here to here is just changing the order. Yeah. Okay. So g of x spits out the negative value at the opposite point. Whatever the value is at one point, you get the exact opposite value at the opposite point from this g of x function. Okay. Let me help this make intuitive sense. If I look at the differences, difference in temperature from this point to the opposite side here, let's say here it's 70 degrees, somewhere down in who knows where it's 40 degrees, the difference is then 30 degrees. 30 degrees. So I'm saying if you were to measure the difference now from there, you would have gotten negative 30 degrees as a difference. Yeah. That's all this is saying. G of X is just the difference. Right? G of X is the difference. Yeah. So okay. the value at one point of G of X, if you measure the difference from one point, it's going to be the negative of what you measure from the opposite point. Okay. So if we measure from here, we measure 30. If they measure from there, they measure negative 30 as the difference. That's all we're seeing. Very intuitive, right? Mm -hmm. Just easy to get lost in all the symbols. Yeah. Okay. Now let P be any point on the sphere. Doesn't matter. And observe that if G at that point equals zero, we're done. So pick any point on the sphere. We're saying if you happen to pick a point where the temperature is the exact same one on the other side, we're already done. If the difference at that point is already zero, we're done. Right? Okay. So pick any point P on the sphere you want and observe that if G of P already happened to be zero, well, that's the same thing as F of P minus F of negative P equals zero, which means F of P equals F of negative P. We're done. Yeah. Okay. However, if G of P is not equal to zero, then G of P and G of negative P have opposite signs. Yeah. If you measure the difference and you get a positive number from here, you get a negative if you measure the difference from the other side. So G of P gave us a positive number and a negative number, Which and it's a continuous function. You get the middle one if you So if it gives you a positive and negative and it's continuous, and your median value theorem says it gives you zero somewhere in between. Yep. Cool. So since G of P and G of negative P have opposite signs, then by the intermediate value theorem, there exists some point, who knows where it is, on the sphere such that g at that point is zero, which means that the difference is equal to zero, which means that they give you the same value. Yeah. It is. It's amazing how simple that is to prove, huh? Yeah. So simple, nothing crazy happening there, and yet the, imp the applications of that are just crazy. All right. So that's the end of the intermediate value theorem. Uh, and...